الحمدللہ رب العالمین والصلاة والسلام علی سید المسلین اما بعد فاعود باللہ من شیطان الرجیم بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم الصلاة والسلام علیکہ یا رسول اللہ وعلا آلک وصحابک یا حبیب اللہ الصلاة والسلام علیکہ یا نبی اللہ وعلا آلک وصحابک یا نور اللہ My dear Islam brothers and viewers of Mother Channel, whenever you are blessed with an opportunity to enter the house of Allah Azza wa Jal, the Masjid, the first thing that you must realize is that you're very, very lucky. Allah Azza wa Jal has blessed you with this opportunity to come to his house. You are the lucky ones that Allah Azza wa Jal has given you the ability to come to his house. But in coming to his house, if we can come to his house according to the sunnah of the Prophet of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, then the reward is so much greater. The Prophet of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam would always enter with his right foot and it would recite the dua for entering the masjid as well. The pious predecessors have said that if you enter the masjid with the intention of nafli taqaf, then inshallah Allah will be written in your book of deeds for the duration that you spend in the masjid, that that time was spent in nafli taqaf. We made this intention by saying nawaitu sunnat al that is in Arabic, you can make it in any language. You can make it in your heart, but by making this intention for the duration that you spend in the masjid, it'll be written in your book of deeds. May I remind you to eat, to drink and to sleep in the masjid is forbidden, but if you make this intention, then all of these things become allowable for you and you get the reward as well. So a small amount of effort, but a huge amount of reward. There are also many blessings in reciting Durud al-Pak upon the Prophet of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The Prophet of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has told us that Allah Azawajal has created a tree in paradise. Its fruit is larger than an apple and smaller than a pomegranate. It is softer than cream, sweeter than honey, and more fragrant than musk. Its branches are made of pearls, its stumps are made of gold, and its leaves are of green jewels. Only the person who sends abundant salat upon the Prophet of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam will be able to eat the fruit from that tree. Sallu ala al-Habib Sallam. My dear Islam brothers, we've said it many, many times, but please, we all have a busy life. We know nowadays people say that our lives are so, so busy. But within our lives, there are times where we are waiting for things to happen. We're waiting for the next customer, we're waiting to see the doctor, waiting to see the dentist, waiting for this, waiting for this. And even if we're not waiting, sometimes we're traveling. You know, everybody travels and when you're traveling, you know, people like to multitask nowadays. And the multitask that I'm going to give to you today, that if you're traveling, if you're waiting, if you're doing something, then you, the best multitask that you can do is send the Park upon the Prophet of Allah Sallallahu There should never be this thing in our dictionary of wasted time. You know, we should never have wasted time. We should never have waiting time. Our time should be utilized. And one of the best ways of utilizing our time is to send Durud Park upon the Prophet of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Who knows that one extra Durud Park that we write today might make all the difference on the Day of Judgment. My dear Islam brothers, today inshallah, we're going to learn and listen to some accounts regarding the modesty of our pious predecessors. Now, Haya, modesty is an article of our faith. And the Prophet of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said that if you have lost your haya, then you can do whatever you like. Now maybe when you hear this statement, you don't fully understand it, but inshallah when we listen to the parables, the things of our pious predecessors, then maybe we'll come to understand the meaning of the hadith of the Prophet of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam when he said it, that if you lose your haya, you can do whatever you like. Umm al-Mu'mineen, Sayyidina Aisha Sadiqa radiallahu ta'ala narrates that the Prophet of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was once on his bed, was covered in her shawl. During this time, Sayyidina Hazrat Abu Bakr Sadiq he came, sought permission to enter, and the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam granted him permission. He, the beloved Prophet of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, fulfilled his need, and then he left. This was all whilst he remained wrapped in that same shawl. Then Sayyidina Umar and he also came in. And again, when he left, the Prophet of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam remained in that same state, covered in that same shawl. Then Sayyidina Usmani Ghani radiallahu ta'ala, and then he sought permission to enter. But when he came, the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sat up and said to Sayyidina Aisha Sadiqa radiallahu ta'ala, take your shawl. Thereafter the Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa also fulfilled his need too, and he also left. Umm al-Mu'mineen, Sayyidina Aisha Sadiqa radiallahu ta'ala, she said, O Messenger of Allah, 
sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, you did not make the same arrangements when Sayyidina Hazrat Abu Bakr Sadiq radiallahu alayhi wa came. You did not make the same arrangements when Sayyidina Umar radiallahu alayhi wa came. But when Sayyidina Osmani radiallahu alayhi wa came, you changed, you different, you were different. The Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam replied, that Usman is a very modest person. If I were to give him permission in that state, then I fear that his needs will remain unfilled. I.e., he would return without mentioning anything. That he was such a modest person, that if he saw the Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa wrapped up in that shoulder, maybe he had to shine us, he might not have said anything. He might not have been asked anything. And so because of the, his modesty, the Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa changed his state. And we see how modest the companion Sayyidina Hazrat Usmani Ghani radiallahu alayhi wa was and his modesty reached a level where I, the Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa the person who is our ideal role model. The Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa is our ideal role model and yet he changed his state when Sayyidina Hazrat Usmani Ghani radiallahu alayhi wa came into the room. Now my dear Islamic brothers and viewers of Malik one thing that as Muslims we are lacking in and it's slightly off the topic is that we do not know about our rich heritage. We don't know about our pious predecessors. We don't know about the companions of the Prophet of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. We do not know about the life of the Prophet of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And nowadays our youngsters, they take all the role models. And the reason why they take all the role models is because they don't know. They think they're, they're embarrassed and they're ashamed of them that we don't have a rich heritage. We don't have these pious people. We don't have these role models. My dear young brothers that are here today and viewers of Mother Challenge, as Muslims we have these role models. We have so many role models. But the sad thing is we don't know anything about our role models. We don't know anything about their lives. If I was to ask the people in this room and the viewers of Madri channel, when was the last time or if ever did we read a seed of the Prophet of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? Did we ever read the life of the companions of the Prophet of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? Did we ever read about the lives of our pious predecessors? And only when we come to read about them, learn about their lives, then we can make a change in our life. Because everything that's been recorded, before I go on, everything that's been brought down to us from 1400 years, from 1200 years, from 1000 years, from whatever has been brought down to us in the past, it's been brought down to us, recorded to us and maintained to us for a reason. If you hear a story from a Mubalik of Dawud Islami that is here standing today and he gives you a story of the past, then that's not just a story. Oh, that's a nice story. I'll tell it to my kids when I go home. That has been brought down through generation and generation and generation. Why? So that we can learn something from it. So whenever you hear about a story of the past, an event of the past, then there's a message there. But it's up to us whether we take that message or not. It's up to us whether we learn something from it or not. You know, there's a saying in English, you can take a horse to water, but you cannot make the horse drink water. We can give you the knowledge. Whether you will take anything from it, that is up to you. Before I continue, I want to mention a little bit about the life of Sayyidina Hazrat Usmani Ghani radiallahu because he, when it comes to modesty, he is again our ideal role model, other than the Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. His name is Usman. He was called Abu Amr. He is the third Khalifa from amongst righteous Khalifas. He was married to two daughters of the Prophet of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi one after another. He bore great resemblance, it is stated, to Sayyidina Ibrahim wasalam, and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Verses of the Quran were revealed regarding his virtue. Even the angels felt shy before him. He migrated twice in the way of Allah Azawajal. He was a successful trader and very generous. The Prophet of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam gave him the glad tidings of paradise. You know, the Prophet of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi there were 10 companions. So this again is a little test for us. That as Muslims, the youngsters that are here today, if I was to say to the youngsters here today, name me 10 football players, you could probably do it. 10 cricketers, you could probably do it. 10 politicians, 10 film stars, 10 singers, you could probably do it. But name the Ashram and Mabashar, those 10 companions that the Prophet of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam guaranteed paradise to. Now we're going to be stuck, aren't we? <coughs> Let's make it a little bit easier then. Ten companions of the Prophet of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Again, we would struggle. Make it even easier. Ten prophets. How many of us can name ten prophets? You know, when you go home tonight, try it. And you realize that we cannot, we struggle to name ten prophets. We struggle to name ten companions, let alone those ten special companions that the Prophet of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said that this companion, he is guaranteed paradise. And we don't know about it. And this is when I say that we don't know about rich heritage, then we don't. This is our rich heritage. We should know these things. As Muslims, we should know who are these great personalities that the Prophet of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he himself said to them that you are guaranteed paradise. And yet we don't know who they are. This is a sad state of affairs. My dear Islam brothers, just ponder for a moment. If that is the level of the modesty of Sayyidina Hazrat Usmani Ghani that, that the angels even felt shy from him, then what could be the modesty of the Prophet of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? It is stated 
the companion Sayyidina Abu Sayyid al Khudri states that the Prophet of Allah وسلم, was more bashful, more shy than an unmarried girl in seclusion. And the renowned commentator of the Quran, Mufti Ahmad Ghar Khan Nimi, when he regards to this, he said that when an unmarried girl is about to get married, she's normally confined to a corner of her home. In this period, a girl is very, very shy. She even displays shyness before her own family and does not say things openly. It is stated that the Prophet of Allah was more bashful than that girl. Modesty is an exclusive attribute of humans. The stronger one's faith is, the greater the level of our modesty. But it's number that as a human being, we go through different stages in our life. We have the childhood, we have the youth, and then we have the old age. During childhood, a person is inclined towards play and entertainment and he wants to enjoy himself. When a person gets old, his person, his limbs become weak, he becomes afflicted with illness, and his inclination towards sin decreases. As you get older, normally, people as they get older, you see them that traditionally they start coming towards the masjid more. Which is a sad thing in a sense, but at least they come then. Whereas in the young, that young age, you're more inclined towards committing sin. It's at that young age that that modesty is something that we need to look up to. We need to try and install modesty inside us. Now, modesty is not like an injection that I can give you an injection and it'll install it inside you. It takes time, it takes knowledge, it takes practice, it takes living your life accordingly. And we need to try and improve ourselves. It is stated that there was a young man during the era of Amir al-Mu'mineen, Sayyidina Hazrat al-Umr al-Faruq And it said that he was a very pious and a devout worshipper. He was young. Sayyidina Umar al-Faruq would also be amazed at his ibadah, at his worshipping. The young man used to go his serve his elderly father after performing Isha Salah in the masjid. On the way to the masjid, a beautiful woman would call him towards her. But the young man would pass by without looking at her or even giving her any attention. Eventually one day, the young man gave in to shaitan's evil whispers and the invitation of this woman. And he started going towards her with an evil intent. However, when he reached the door of where this woman was, he remembered the ayat of the Quran. Allah Azza wa says in Surah Al-Araf, verse 201, Indeed, those who fear Allah, Whenever a temptation from the devil touches them, they become alert. And at that very moment, the eyes open up. Allah Akbar. As soon as he remembered this verse, the fear of Allah overcame his heart so much that he fell unconscious on the ground. And when he fell unconscious on the ground, he was there on the ground. And his father was waiting for him to come home. And when his father did not realize that he did not come home, he went out to find him and he found him unconscious on the ground. He picked him up and brought him home. And when he brought him home, and he regained consciousness eventually. He said to his son, that my son, what happened to you? And when his son related the whole incident, and his son remembered what he had done, again he screamed. Again he screamed. And again he went unconscious. But this time when he went unconscious, he breathed his last and he passed away. His ghusl, shroud and burial were arranged overnight. In the morning, when this incident was mentioned to Amir al-Mu'mineen, Sayyidina Hazrat Umar al-Farooq, he went to offer his condolences to the young man's father. He said to him, why did you not inform me? Why did you not inform me? I would have attended the funeral. He said to him that it was during the night. And we thought that maybe you were resting. Sayyidina Hazrat Umar al-Farooq, he said, take me to this grave. Take me to this grave. And when he arrived there, he recited this verse. And I give you the translation from Kanzul Iman. Surah al rahman Verse 46, and the one who fears standing in the majestic court of his Lord, for him are two paradises. Allah Akbar. The young man called out from the grave in a loud voice, O oh, Amir al-Mu'mineen, surely my Lord has granted me two paradises. <laughs> my dear Islam brothers and viewers of Muni Channel, these people of the past, even during their youth, the friends of Allah Azzawajal, had a firm mindset of performing acts of worship and avoiding immodesty, such that they would spend most of their time in worship and serving their parents. They would remain wary of shaitan's attacks at all time, which was the reason why, despite having the ability to sin, they would safeguard their gaze and avoid staining their pure character with acts of immorality. But Islam, brothers and viewers, you need to understand this, that shaitan is our enemy. Full stop. No ifs, no buts, nothing like. And he's our age older and he'll always be our enemy. And he will try his best to divert us from the path of righteousness and towards the path of evil. 
And as a result of that, we see that in society today, immodesty is everywhere. These are all the works of shaitan. These are all the things of shaitan. And this is in shaitan that's enticing us to take our iman away from us. These are all our tests. And we need to protect ourselves. And what happens is maybe in this country, especially I see that what happens in this country, we become immune to it. We become immune to it. And I'll give you an example. I don't know if you've ever realized this. If somebody comes from abroad for the very first time from Pakistan or India, your relative comes here for the very first time. You pick him up from the airport. And as you're coming home from the airport, he sat, in, he sat next to you and he's going, Astaghfirullah. And you're thinking, eh, what's up with him? He's saying Astaghfirullah all the way home. Because he is seeing things on billboards. He's seeing things on the side of the streets that he's never seen before. And he doesn't want to see it. But when we see it, we're not bothered. Because we're immune to it. You see all the time, we think there's nothing wrong with it. But there is something wrong with it. Just because it's happening all the time does not mean to say we should not lower our gaze, but we don't because we become immune to it. And someone gave us a beautiful example once. He said that if you put a frog, a frog in hot water, then the frog will jump out of the hot water. Right? Because the water is hot. But if you put the frog in cold water, it's happy. Then put the oven on at low heat and slowly, slowly, slowly warm up the temperature. And as the water gets hotter and hotter and hotter, the frog tries to change itself, to adapt itself to the temperature, but it can't. And a certain time comes where the frog dies. That person that comes from Pakistan or India the first time, he is like that frog that's thrown in that hot water. He jumps out because he's shocked and he wants to protect himself. Whereas us, we're like that frog in that cold water. Slowly, slowly the poison is affecting us. Slowly, slowly we're realizing that this is okay. Before we don't realize it, we're going to be spiritually dead. Before we realize it, our iman is going to be taken away from us. So it's very important on us that we protect ourselves. Allah Azza wa Jal says in the Quran in Surah Al-Baqarah, and do not follow the footsteps of the devil. Undeadly, he is your open enemy. He, the devil, will instruct you only towards evil and indecency. And he will instruct this, that you should fabricate that matter concerning Allah which you know not. This is the mission of shaitan. Regarding this verse, it is written in Tafsir Siratul Janan, that it is the job of shaitan to invite people towards evil, to invite people towards disbelief, to invite people towards polytheism, to attributing false beliefs regarding Allah Azza wa Jal, declaring his halal haram and his haram as halal, or towards immoral deeds such as lying, backbiting, slandering, quarreling, being jealous, having malice and other evils. Similarly, calling towards immorality such as music, films, dramas, dancing, unlawful graces, immoral and indecent speech, unlawful relations, looking and touching with an evil intention is all the job of shaitan. Unfortunately, he goes on to say in Siratul Jinnah, in today's day and age, a person's family, friends, household, boss, the marketplace and society at large all play a role in inviting towards those evil actions. And if we think about it, it's true. To stay away from sin is very, very hard. But we should try to rectify ourselves, our family members, everybody. It is our responsibility. In Surah Al-Azab, verse 33, Allah Azza wa Jal says, And stay in your homes, and do not remain unveiled like the former unveiling in the time of ignorance. In Surah Al-Nur, verse 31, Allah Azza wa Jal says, And command the Muslim women to keep the gaze slightly low, and to protect the chastity, and not to reveal the adornment except what is apparent itself, and to keep the head covering wrapped over the bosom, and not to reveal their adornment. My dear Islam brothers and viewers, I'm on the channel. A woman, our sisters, they play a major role in waywardness and rectification of society. For example, if the woman is righteous and modest, then inshallah these qualities will be transferred to her children too. Therefore, our sisters, instead of adopting impermissible fashion trends and attending places of indecency, should take lessons from the pure lives and character of the blessed wives and the daughters of the Prophet of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. In particular, the queen of paradise. Again, the ideal role model for our sisters. Again, when I say to you is that we don't know our rich heritage. The ideal role model for our sisters, the queen of paradise. Sayyidina Fatima Tuzara, the, the Prophet of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's daughter. She is again our sister's ideal role model. But again, how much do we know about her? How much do our sisters know about her? When we think about it, how embarrassing it is that we know so little about our deen. That we know so little about these people. Like I said earlier on, we can ask the youngsters in here to name football players, they can do it. They can probably name the whole team, the, the team that maybe they support, they can name all of the players, the positions that they play. 
the substitutes, the captain, the manager. They can name all of this. But when it comes to Adin, it is stated that after the Prophet of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam put a curtain between this world and the next, Sayyidina Fatima radiallahu anha, she was overcome with such grief that a smile was never seen on her face. And it said that she only smiled once. She only smiled, after the Prophet of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam put a curtain between this world and the next world, she only smiled once. And this happened when what happened was, Sayyidina Asma bint Umais, she said that I've seen in Abyssinia that they tie branches of tree upon the funeral bier, creating a frame. They create a frame because you remember that they had the, the funeral, uh, like a, 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 thing, a table that they carried the body on, they used to take it to the graveyard and the body could be seen. And she was worried that when I pass away, even though I'll be wrapped and I'll be shredded, people will be able to see me. And she saw that in Abyssinia that they made a, a tree, like a, a covering and they put branches over it so that you could not see who was inside there, who was being about to be buried. And when she saw that, that was the only time she smiled. That was the only time she smiled because she realized that now I will be covered when I pass away as well. She was so concerned about this. This is the modesty. Likewise, it is narrated about the female companion of the Prophet of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Sayyiduna Umm Khalid Radiallahu Anhu, that her son was martyred in a battle. And in order to find about his state, she went to the Prophet of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And when she went, she was covered with a veil over her face. She just heard that her son had been martyred in the battlefield. And she went to the Prophet of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam to find out if this is true or not. But she covered herself up. And when she went, and people saw her, they said, even at this moment when you have lost your son, even at this moment when you've given the news that you've lost your soul, you still cover yourself up, you still put your veil on you? And she said, I have lost my son. I've not lost my modesty. Allah. At that crucial moment, you know, you see people when some, this bad news comes to you, you don't think twice. But then words have gone down in history. Then words have gone down in history that I've lost my son, but I've not lost my modesty. That is something for us to ponder over. This was her modesty. Regarding unlawful gazing, the Prophet of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said that a woman is something to be hidden. So when she comes out, shaitan gazes at her closely. The adultery of the eyes. You know, people when they say, what is adultery? People think that adultery, of, adultery is a physical act. An act that you have to do with your hands, with your body, this is the act of adultery. The Prophet of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said the adultery of the eyes is looking. Looking is adultery. The gaze, our look is an arrow of shaitan dipped in poison. So the one who leaves it for my sake, I will grant him such face, the sweetness of which he will feel in his heart. The Prophet of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said if you can control this gaze, if you can control this gaze for my sake, I will grant that person such faith, the sweetness of which he will feel in his heart. Imam Muhammad Ghazali mentions in Minaj al Abideen is narrated from Sayyidina Isa salatu wasalam, that save yourself from unlawful glances for it sows the seed of lust in the heart. Then lust causes the one who gazes unlawfully to fall into trials. These are messages for us, warnings for us. If only we listen to these and follow these. It narrated that Sayyidina Aswad bin Khutum was a very modest and righteous young man. Whilst walking, he would always keep his gaze lowered, such that would, he would be unaware of who was passing by him. At that time, the walls of the hall were not very high. Once he was walking by some house when he heard a woman say to another woman, quickly enter your homes, a young man is passing by. They were not covered properly. Quickly get into your homes. A young man is passing by. And another woman said, but this is Sayyidina Aswad bin Khultum. He never listens his gaze from the ground. So how will he look at a non meru woman? Allah Akbar. It is said that Sayyidina Majma, Rahmatullah Ta'ala once looked up and his gaze happened to fall upon a woman who was on rooftop. He lowered his gaze at once and he vowed never to look up again. This was the modesty of our people. But nowadays we see that with these sort of things. You know, there was a time where, you know, the Mubalik of Dawes, I mean, he'd stand here and he'd say to the people that, look, you know, if you've got a computer in your room, make sure that you keep it in the living room. 
Yeah? This is the advice that we used to give to people. Keep it in the living room so you can see what your children are seeing. You can look at what your children, you can monitor what your children are doing. Now our children are walking around with computers in their pockets. It's so easy to commit sin. It's so easy to commit a sin. Now it is, it's so readily available. Many years ago, here in the UK, when there were TVs, there was only three or four channels. Now there's hundreds of channels. Years ago, if there was going to be a TV in the house, there was one in the house. In the living room where all the family was sitting. Now there's TVs in every room. And if there's not TVs in every room, these are in every room. They're in every pocket. So to stay away from the whisper of the shaitan is even harder. And we need to realize this. And you know when, when a thing, when something becomes harder, when a task becomes harder, you need to up your game as they say. You need to be stronger, you need to be firmer. You need to put them things in place to protect your iman. Maybe 50 years ago, 100 years ago, these temptations were not there. In one way you could say it was easier to protect your iman. Now it's hard. And if it's harder, then we need to be stronger. If the task is harder, you need to be stronger. If you have to mark one mile a day to work, then how strong do you need to be? If you have to work 10 miles a day to work, you have to be stronger. In the same way that 50 years ago, 25 years ago, the temptation of shaitan was not the same as it is today. And it's getting worse day by day, day by day. So it's our responsibility to up our game. It is our responsibility to put in those things in place to protect our iman. And hopefully towards the end we'll mention a few of these things of how we can do this. You know, when I came here, I parked my car in the car park. I mentioned this many times before. When I parked my car in the car park, the first thing I did when I got out of the car, I pressed a button to lock the car. And you probably all did the same, you lock your cars. You lock your houses. Why? Because you don't want anybody to steal your car. You don't want anybody to break in your house. But how many of us think about locking our iman? How many of us think about what we need to do to protect our iman? What locks we need to put in place to protect our iman? Have we ever thought about it? Or have we ever concerned about it? You know, it's a coincidence that in this country they say that if you want to get insurance on the house, you need five lever locks. Islam says we're giving you five lever locks to protect your iman. In this country it says, look, if you have a seven lever lock and nine lever, you get a cheaper insurance policy. We'll give you more locks. Josh, the shraq, abin, tahajjat, reading the Quran, fasting, nafal fast, traveling in the way of Allah, coming to this ishtama, traveling in a madri kafla, these are all locks for your iman. But again, like I said at the beginning, you can take a horse to water, you cannot force it to drink. It's upon you whether you want to put these locks on you, whether you want to protect your iman or not. Because that car that's outside, my car that's outside, if it's going to be stolen, it'll be stolen by a human being. But who is it that steals my iman? Shaitan. Shaitan is more cunning and conniving than any human being. He will try any trick in the book to take my iman away from me. So if I'm scared about someone pinching my car, I should be more scared about my, losing my iman. And if I lose my car, then so what? I can get another one. You know, the brothers will give me a lift home, inshallah. I'll get a lift home. But if I lose my iman, it's gone. It's a one-way ticket. So we should be very, very scared. We should always be scared. And if we're not scared, then this is a reason to be scared. Then why are we not scared? We should think to us, why am I not scared about losing my iman? I should be worried about this. And if I'm not worried, then this is my problem. And I need to reflect on this. It is stated that Sayyidina Yunus bin Yusuf was a young man who spent most of his time in the masjid. Once whilst returning home from the masjid, his gaze unexpectedly fell upon a woman and his heart inclined towards her. However, he felt ashamed and at once and repented. He then made the dua, listen to this, he made the dua in the court of Allah. O Allah, although my eyes are a great blessing, Although my eyes are a great blessing, I am becoming concerned that they will lead to my destruction and that I will be afflicted by the punishment because of them. Oh my Lord, oh my Creator, take away my sight. Thus his dua was accepted and he became blind. Allahu Akbar. And nowadays we have gatherings to remember our pious predecessors. We have khatams, we have the Yarmis, the Barwis, we have all the other khatams and we remember those pi people, but do we try and live our lives like them? Do we try and follow in their footsteps? And I keep on emphasizing this, that we need to learn from their lives. Don't just come and eat the langa, learn from their lives, how they live their lives, what they did in their lives. 
the efforts they made, the sacrifices they made, the struggles they made, so that the deen could come to us in its form that it is today. Every single one of them, all of our pious predecessors didn't have an easy life. None of them had an easy life. They all struggled and strived to acquire the knowledge of the deen. They traveled hundreds of miles to listen to one hadith. They traveled hundreds of miles on horseback and camelback to learn from one teacher. And nowadays we can't even come to the weekly shlama. Nowadays we can't come and attend a course. Nowadays we can't even travel in the way of Allah for three days. Last weekend I was on a Madhuri Kafla and when I was on the Madhuri Kafla, people were giving us food. People were giving us gifts. And I thought to myself, there was a time in the Prophet of Allah when they used to travel. They were not met with food, they were not met with gifts, they were met with swords. And yet they still traveled. They still traveled to spread the deen of Islam. When the Prophet of Allah says, spread this message, they left. 110,000 companions listened to the final khutbah of the Prophet of Allah but only 10,000 are buried in Jannatul Baqi. Where are the 100,000? They traveled in the way of Allah. They didn't have Google to check what the weather's like there. They didn't have the news to see, oh, what's the situation over there like there? What's it going to be like there? They left. They traveled to spread the deen of Islam. What is our excuse? What is our problem? What difficulty are we facing? We know where we're going. We're going to a masjid a few streets away. We're going to a masjid in another town where other people have already been. We're not going to somewhere new where nobody's ever been before. We've got nothing to be afraid of. We know that we're going to eat there, we're going to sleep there, we're going to rest there, there's a shelter there, there's everything there. And yet we still don't do it. We need to think that what were the Muslims of the past like and what are we like? And then maybe, just maybe because of that, the problems that we are facing today is because of the problems of the past. And we need to think about this. We need to understand the problems that we are facing. In current times, Alhamdulillah, we are here today. When we talk about immodesty, I want to give you an example of Amir al-Sunnah. It is stated that once Amir al-Sunnah was coming to Karachi to the airport, and he was arriving at 3 o'clock in the morning, and he knew that there's a lot of people at the airport. So he wrote a letter to his son. That my son, when you come to the airport, you don't come. Don't bring a lot of people to the airport. Make it quiet because everybody's there. There's a lot of women there. There's a lot of people there. People will be looking at each other. They'll man not always lower the gaze. So rather than put them under the test, tell the security to wait in the car park. I'll come to the car park and I'll get in the security. I'll come home. And he instructed people, don't come. This is how we need to live our lives. We need to protect ourselves. Our speech as well. Not only is our gaze immoral, but our speech is immoral as well. When people are sitting together, they start talking about all sorts of things and the immoral speech that they do. And again, this is wrong. I know time is against me. I want to give you one, one vakia before I finish. That maybe you'll understand the problems, the reasons that we are facing a problem. I've mentioned this on Madhuri Channel before. I don't know if I mentioned it to the people in Birmingham. Just to mention to the viewers of Madhuri Channel, we're in Fazana Madina in Stretchfield in Birmingham. I should have mentioned this at the beginning. Alhamdulillah, here we have uh, a Jamatul Madina, a Madrasatul Madina. And here in Birmingham, we have Darul Madinas, Madrasatul Madinas, many buildings, many activities in Birmingham here in the UK. Those of you that have read history may have heard about a time in the 16th and 17th century where battles took place in Europe between Muslims and non Muslims. And an incident took place once. I read this person in a book that the Muslim army was traveling from a place called Istanbul, which you all know is in Turkey, traveling to a place called Vienna. Vienna is in Austria. And the Muslim army stopped at a place called Belgrade. And when the Muslim army stopped there to rest, there was a person at the top of the hill looking at the Muslim army. And he thought to himself that wherever this army goes, it's successful. I need to do something. I need to do something. Because wherever this army goes, it's successful. So he came up with a plan. The plan was that he would gather all of the beautiful women of the town. Get them all to wear nice clothes. Get them all to put whatever makeup they had and put it on them. And he gave them all a bucket. He gave them all a bucket. And he said to these women, that the Muslims, they pray five times a day. But before they pray, they perform the ablution. In the middle of the town, there's a fountain. When the time for prayer comes, when the time for Salah comes, they will go there to perform the ablution. You go there as well and make it look that you're going there to fill up your buckets with water. 
So the time for Salah comes. The Muslim army goes to the center of the town to perform the Salah. They perform the ablution. The women are walking down the hill with the buckets in the hands. And as they get to the bucket of the hill, in the book it doesn't say exactly what sign was made, but one person from the Muslim army, he made a sign. And as a result of that sign, the whole of the Muslim army moved to one side. And the backs were to the women. You can't talk to backs. So the women had no choice. What did they do? They filled up the buckets and they went back up the hill. The person at the top of the hill is watching this. He's watching this. And he writes a letter. And in the letter he writes, and he said, take this to the army that the Muslims are going to face. And he gave it to the fastest horseman. And in the letter he wrote, run for your lives, for you'll never defeat the Muslims. Run for your lives, for you'll never defeat the Muslims. Question for all of us, what did he see? F-16 bombers, ground to air missiles, hundreds and thousands of tanks, Million man army? No. He saw the haya of the Muslims. He saw the character of the Muslims. Now what is sad, what is really sad, is that that non-Muslim realized that that is our strength. He realized that that is our strength. But we don't realize it. That haya is from the character of the Prophet of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The haya is from the sunnah of the Prophet of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So if I say to you today that the reason why Muslims are facing difficulty all around the world is because we've gone away from the Quran and the sunnah of the Prophet of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And that is just one instance to explain it why. That if a non-Muslim realizes that that is our strength, why are we not adopting it? And in every household now, there are problems. Everybody will tell you they've got problems. The Prophet of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said the Quran are my way. Follow them, you will never go astray. I've mentioned it many times before, but I'll just mention it for the people of Birmingham. The viewers maybe have heard this before. You go to a doctor. I'm ill. I don't feel well. The doctor does all these checks. He takes your blood. He gives you a report, and depending upon the road, he'll give you some medicine, and sometimes you might have to take it the rest of your life. Cholesterol, sugar, whatever it is, you have to take this medicine the rest of your life. He gives you a prescription. You take the prescription, you walk, put it in your pocket, you walk out of the surgery. Three months later, if that same person goes back to the doctor and says to the doctor, Doctor, you know, I came to you three months ago, I wasn't feeling well. Now I'm feeling really bad. Now I'm really struggling. What is the first thing the doctor will say to you? Did you take the medicine? That's what he's going to ask you, isn't he? He's going to, did you take the medicine? And if at that moment you say, oh, Dr. Saab, here's the prescription. The doctor's going to laugh at you and say, you're wasting my time. I've given you the prescription. I've given you the remedy for your illness and you're not taking it. The Quran on my way, follow them, you will never go astray. What is the difference between that patient who puts the prescription in his pocket and doesn't utilize it and knows having the Quran on the shelf and never opening it? What is the difference between that person who doesn't take the medicine and us who do not live our lives according to the Sunnah of the Prophet of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? There is no difference. In fact, we are more foolish than him because the doctor could give the wrong medicine. But when the Prophet of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam telling us the Quran in my way, follow them, you will never go astray, without a doubt it is the truth. And that is why we are failing. That is why we are struggling. So Dawah Islam is here to help us to learn to read the Quran, to adopt the Quran, to read the Quran. Amir al in his pious deed book, he said at least three verses of the Quran every day with translation and commentary. It's not a huge task. Three verses of the day. I know we have a brother here that studied geology. He will tell you. That when water drops on stone, water drops on stone and it keeps on dropping on a stone, then eventually that water will make a hole in the stone. If three drops of the Quran, three verses of the Quran fall on our heart every day, without a doubt it will make a difference to our hearts. But again, you can take a horse to water, you cannot force it to drink. The Sunnah of the Prophet of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi again, how easy is it to adopt it? You have to make very, very little changes in your life. We all cut our nails, we all eat, we all drink, we all sleep, we all walk, we all talk. If we did all of these things according to the sunnah, how much difference is it? How hard is it to have this sun on the face? I've not had to do anything. It grew itself. So living our life according to the sunnah of the Prophet of Allah is not hard. So the question is now on us. Do we want to make a change? 
And we need to make a change to protect our iman. Like I said to you before, shaitan is working 24 hours a day, taking your iman away from you. And we need to be concerned not only about our iman, but our children's iman. You, nobody in this room can guarantee to me that they will die with iman. But if you were to say, yeah, okay, if I was to give a percentage, there's a 50, yeah, there's 80% chance I'll die with iman. Can you give the same figure for your children? Can you give the same figure for your grandchildren? As generations come, we need to put these things in place to protect their iman. We need to put these things in place to protect their iman. Nikanai Shura, he gave us a beautiful Madhuri Pearl. He said that we, the Muslims of today, the workers that are working for Dawah Islam, they are the motorway builders of the Ummah of the future. And he explained, he said that when you come, like I came down the motorway, I came down the M6. I was traveling at 70 miles an hour. But that motorway, when it was built, one mile of it might have taken six months. But they built it. They built it so that I can travel at 70 miles an hour. Our job is not only to protect our Iman, but our job is to put those institutes in place, to put those madrasas in place, to put the masjids in place, to put them schools in place, to put the jamias in place so that the ummah of the future can live easily. That is our task. That is everybody's task. And so for that, we need to give time to acquire the knowledge of the deen. Give time to protect our Iman. Give time to protect others' Iman. And that is the mission statement of Dawah Islam, that I must strive to rectify myself and rectify the people of the whole world. If it was not for that one person that left his home more than 40 years ago, he didn't have cars then. He left on foot with his tiffin in his hand. And he gave everything. And it's because of him that we are here today. It's because of him that we have these mother channels, these all these things that are happening around us. So we owe it to him. We owe him to him. What does he want from us? He doesn't want us to send him gifts of a thousand pound, five hundred pound as a gift. No, he wants us to travel in the way of Allah. He wants to, so to protect our Iman, to put in things in place, to protect our Iman and put in place things for others as well. These are the gifts that he wants. So we owe it to Amir al the founder of Dao Islami, the originator of Dao Islami, to change, to make a change, to carry on with this mission. So that not only do we have this institute here in Stetshwood, but we have many others as well. And we have them. Alhamdulillah, in the UK, we have more than 70 buildings in the UK. We have more than 5,000 children in our madrasas. We have nearly 1,000 children in our Jamat al Madinas. We have 12 or 14 Dal al Madinas in the UK. But there's a need for more. So I'm requesting all of you, please, join the environment of Dal Islami. By joining the environment of Dal Islami, when I joined, I'll tell you, when I joined, I didn't join to stand up here. My intention was never to stand up here and talk to you. My intention was to sort myself out. And I'm still trying to sort myself out. That I must strive to rectify myself. That's my intention. And that's everybody's intention, that I must strive to rectify myself. But when you come into the environment of Dawah time to strive to rectify yourself, Amir Sundi puts that pain inside you as well. That, okay, you're sorting yourself out. You're working on it. Good, mashallah. But what about others as well? I must strive to rectify myself and the people of the whole world. And if the brothers of Dawah Islami, the sisters that are watching of Dawah Islami, if we live our lives like that and die like that, then I believe we are the successful ones. So I'm requesting all of you, I'm giving you all an opportunity. It's a zero membership fee. You don't have to fill in a form. You don't have to pass any test. You don't have to do anything. Come and join the environment of Dawah Islami. The brothers are here to help you in whichever way. And you should never feel embarrassed. Oh, I don't like to read my namaz. Okay, no problem. Come here. I don't like to read my Quran. Okay, no problem. Come here. They will help you. They're all here to help you. And I in particular know that the brothers in Birmingham, they will help you 24 hours a day. Forget 12 hours a day. You say to them, we want to learn at 3 o'clock in the morning, they will be here at 3 o'clock in the morning. And I keep on saying it. You can take a horse to water. You cannot make the horse drink. All we can do is try to make you thirsty, make you realize how important it is. I pray to Allah Azza wa Jalla for sending to me, Allah Azza wa Jalla forgive me. And I pray to Allah Azza wa Jalla, Allah give me and you the tawfiq to think about what I've said to act upon what I've said and to pass this message on to others as well. Sallu ala al-Habib.